Hey, you're watching the Letterman podcast with Mike Chisholm, endorsed by the Hello Deli. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome once again to the Letterman Podcast. My name is Mike Chisholm. Um, I, I, I have a hard time not saying I'm excited about this episode. I actually had an idea in my head that I'm going to say, you know what? I'm not going to say I'm excited for this episode, um, but it just didn't happen because organically I am excited about this episode. I'm excited about them all. Lots of good stuff happening in the world of the Letterman Podcast. Thank you very much to everybody who is uh, piling on um piling into this clown car that is the letterman podcast uh we got a writer this week now before we get going jonathan green uh so excited that he's gonna be here um some neat symmetry with the episode last week with carter bays and then uh you know carter um and craig writing team they leave to go create how i met your mother um and then another writing team shows up uh, Jonathan Green and, and and Gabe Miller and and it's just really neat to have that kind of symmetry happening and we talk about that a little bit in the in, in the episode. Um, great episode. I mean, you know, these guys were were uh, were writers on Late Show for a few years. Um, they moved on. They worked on the last season of The Office and then worked with uh, the creator and they became showrunners of Superstore. So fascinating, lots of stuff to talk about, and we do. It's a great episode. Um, but before we get to it, we're going to talk right now about the writer's strike. Uh, obviously, we are throwing as much support as we can for what it's worth. But you know what? For what it's worth, I think everybody who – anybody who supports these people and puts it out there publicly I think is a good thing. So uh, don't think that your voice is too small. Um, if you know somebody in the WGA or or you see these people posting, you know, Bill Sheft has been posting a lot of stuff, um, you know, jump on there, like that stuff, share that stuff. These people, these uh, these writers, these people who 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 – really really delve deep sometimes into the into the the muck that is creativity and pull out these original ideas um you know it's it's we're at a place right now where uh with ai the invention of ai and, and and some of these other uh things we're on the precipice of things changing well let's give these people a deal uh for the next decade so things can settle down and they can figure things out or whatever let's 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 support these writers um Gosh, I, I just appreciate getting to know so many of the former writers for David Letterman and company and and and, and other projects as well. And uh, they're just a special group of people. So we want to just say uh, from us at the Letterman podcast, we support everybody on the crew here, right? Yeah, there's nobody here. Uh, we all support the writers uh, that are on strike right now. Thank you very, very much for everything that you do. Um, and then let's bring it back to the episode here. Jonathan Green, thank you so much for your contribution to um, the world of David Letterman and company. And we appreciate you taking time out of your day to come here and to talk to us. Uh, that's what the audience is here for. So without further ado, the Letterman Podcast is proud to present Jonathan Green. Jonathan, I, oh, dude, I am really, really excited to talk to you for a variety of reasons. Um, but of course, this is the Letterman podcast. We want to talk to you about the letter, about your time at Letterman. And, and I want to talk about the office. I want to talk about Superstore. I guess for you, when people do want to talk to you about this stuff, many times you are more known for like the Superstore or the office. And that's really where people focus their attention and time on you these days, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, Superstore is obviously mo the most recent thing, but didn't quite have the um, cultural impact that the other two shows, <laughs> that The Office or uh, The Late Show had. So, um, yeah, lately it's been more about Superstore, uh, for sure. Um, it was also my uh, longest stint on any show. Really. It was the longest job I've ever had in the business. It was six seasons um so yeah there's uh the most experience there for sure we're gonna get there because uh as we as as you and i talked about beforehand uh, I, you know there's a costco connection here uh right. no pun intended to the to the periodical that costco puts out <laughs> monthly um I, I i can't wait to talk to you about superstore um i definitely definitely have some questions about the office i'm one of the the people that really enjoyed the last two seasons of the office and enjoyed kind of where things went and some of the, the 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 things i can't wait to ask you about those things but obviously 
going back to the letterman of it all uh very very excited to have you here i i it's ironic in the narrative of where this show is going uh i believe if we have it done right it'll be carter bays then it'll be you which is very uh-huh. interesting because mm-hmm. carter um and 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 craig came on as kind of a writing team did their run they leave you and Gabe come in as kind of a a writing team, and and I, I love that. That's just that's organically happened. There was nothing yeah. uh, planned about that. We um, overlapped with them by about a month. Yeah, uh, yeah, we yeah. came in right at the end of their run, and those were some gigantic shoes to fill. Obviously, Gabe and I didn't have nearly the impact on the show that those two had, um, and it was intimidating for sure to be working with those guys. And not that we were brought in to fill their shoes, but. Yep. Um, but we, you know, we ended up moving into their office and uh, all we heard the whole time we were there was, you know, Carter and Craig had this great idea for this and uh, you know, Carter and Craig did that. And, and <laughs> a lot of the bits that we were still working on and pitching for were things that they had created while they were there. So, yeah, uh, I, I was in awe of those guys, continue to be in awe of those guys. Uh, but I'm glad we got the chance to overlap a little bit with them. The writing teams uh, on Late Show, uh, back to late night, all the way back to late night. Like I think of, you know, again, I brought this up before, but Steven Weiner and uh, um, and Carl Tiedemann, you know, you know, Calvert DeForest, the whole thing, like building the infrastructure of the show, things that would continue on till the very end of the show. Uh, writer teams have always kind of been a part of this production. I'm super curious as to where you and Gabe connected. Um and 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 the what brought you to Letterman? I really want to talk about that. How did you get that gig? Was it um, was there reverence for it in the sense of so many people worship this groundbreaking franchise, and 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 you got a chance to work on it? Was there was there awe and shock? Um, so let's 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 start there, and then uh, take it from there. Yeah, all of that for sure. Um, there's <laughs> tons of reverence and awe um, and just excitement at getting the chance to to work on the show. Um, but yeah, to take it back a little bit, um, yeah. Gabe and I met in college. Uh, we were in an improv group together uh, and that's how it started. Right uh, on. And then uh, after we graduated, uh, Gabe was a couple of years ahead of me. Um, but we both ended up moving to LA at the same time and um, to basically try to write for TV um, or try to get assistant jobs that would then eventually lead to getting to write for TV. Um, We lived with a bunch of other college friends in a house that we rented and we basically just tried to keep the college experience going as long as possible. Awesome. Uh, uh, And so we were both, we both worked as assistants on different shows. um, In LA. Yeah, in LA. Yeah. What uh, college did you go to? I went to Stanford. Up to Stanford. The- and what? Uh, uh, interesting. So we've got a Stanford crew, uh, you know, f- waving the flag mightily against the Harvard lineage that shows yeah. up there. Um, That's right. Yeah, there were study? a few others. Um, you know, Chris Harris went to Stanford. Um, he was a few years ahead of us. I, I didn't know him there. Yeah. Uh, I, we didn't meet until we got the job on The Late Show. Um and yeah, worked with him there. And actually we just ended up working with Chris again about a year ago on uh, the show Acapulco that he was running mm-hmm. for Apple TV. Um, but yeah, and there and Pete Hike and Alex Gregory, I don't know if you know those guys yep. or talked to them, but they were- Haven't talked to them yet, but let's connect it because I want Another Stanford team, but yeah, I don't actually know them. They were also a few years ahead of me. Um, so, and we didn't overlap at, at Letterman at all. Um, but- yeah. What did you study? Uh, psychology and English. And, and where did that fascinates me because there's so many people who end up being comedy writers that did not go to school to get communications or get broadcasting. Um, you know, the improv group, obviously there's some seeds yeah. there. Uh, where did this, and I did uh, as much, you know, I did as much comedy writing as I could. Um, uh, it was always like something I loved doing, you know, from back in high school, even, um and just sort of grabbed every opportunity in college that I could to write comedy there were student uh, written productions and yep. um there's a, a friend of mine Joel Stein who uh, is a a journalist magazine writer podcaster now um but he had he tried to do during college sort of his own version of a, a, a letterman like talk show and I was one of the writers on that show it was awesome 
very short lived, but uh, yeah, that, you know, any, any opportunity um, to write, you know, I was taking, but um, in the psychology major, I was mostly focused on developmental psychology um, and actually had thought about sort of combining that interest with my comedy and TV writing interest in writing for children's television. And Gabe had actually had similar thoughts. Um, and so the two of us at first were talking about trying to write for children's TV together, like, uh, you know, with Sesame Street or something being the, um, the dream job. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, I, uh, yeah, I wanted to bring this up because uh, I know you're a Mr. Rogers fan. Very right? much so. Um, and I actually had the opportunity to uh, work. I, I grew up in Pittsburgh, which is where he was from and where the show was made. I have and goosebumps right now. Yeah. <laughs> so I worked, I had a summer internship working for the show and for family communications. Um, they were at, they weren't in production while I was there, but I oh. was um, helping sort his fan mail uh, in the office. And there must have been to, tons. Yes. Tons of fan mail. Wow. Yeah, and actually, yeah, one thing I, I uh, a souvenir I, I kept from uh, there was that I have here framed, um, which was in his handwriting, um, <laughs> Mr. Rogers handwriting. This is a particularly uh, enjoyable. This is a, a fan letter that had already been responded to and stuff, but I was filing it away or whatever. And he wrote, um, uh, so this was a submission he had gotten uh, for, I guess, some sort of uh, musical element someone wanted him to, to incorporate on the show. And he wrote, um, Elaine, let's ask Jay Costa, that's Johnny Costa, the music guy on the show, to yeah. answer this. I find the sameness in the musical themes to be disconcerting and boring, and the theme of child sacrifice to be intolerable in a piece for children. <laughs> <laughs> which I thought it was just a great example of burying the lead. I mean, maybe that's the, should be the most disqualifying thing before the <laughs> sameness in the musical themes. Um, but uh, I just loved the sort of, uh, you know, perfect Mr. Rogers tone there, but also the idea that somebody would send something to him that involved child sacrifice with the idea of it uh, possibly getting on the show. Oh uh, my God. That's so funny. Yeah. And so he would, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, you go, please, please. <laughs> Well, so he was um, not, he was away in Nantucket. The show was on hiatus while I was there. So I was working in the office. He yeah. came back to work on what happened to be my last day uh, working there. So I did get to meet him finally, which was a thrill for me. Um, but also our conversation was uh, great and very memorable. He, um, someone introduced me to him and said, Jonathan's been helping out in the office, uh, but he's going back to, to school now because this was before my senior year of college. Yeah. Um, and he said, oh, uh, where do you go to school? And I said, uh, Stanford. And he's like, oh, well, you're very lucky to be at that school. And I was like, yes, I know. And he said, and they're very lucky to have you too. Oh my God. Which was <laughs> the most Mr. Rogers thing he could have said in that moment. And, you know, he had known me for all of, 30 seconds at that point but somehow it just felt so sincere so, and it made me feel so good yeah it made and, you feel like a million damn dollars wow yeah and it was like yeah it was just the perfect interaction and, you're giggling thinking about it right now and that's yeah that's totally. people who had interactions with him they giggle when they talk about it because mm -hmm. of the the kindness the sincerity and just the the complex simplicity of 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 of, of mr rogers of fred rogers and and i yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was he was my gateway broadcaster. He was he was he absolutely. Yeah, I've was. heard you say that. That's great. Um, yeah, and so I was a huge fan, obviously, and and Gabe happened to be a big fan of Mr. Rogers too, and he also had studied developmental psychology. The two of us for a while were talking about just uh, writing for kids TV uh, yeah. and educational kids TV uh, specifically. Yeah. Um, but then paths lead you where they lead you, kind of, and uh, we, we ended up writing for some uh kids shows on nickelodeon fun uh, which were all that and keenan and kel um yeah. which were lots of fun to work on and you know not necessarily the educational mr rogers -y stuff or sesame yeah. street -y stuff that we uh had thought about doing but um yeah sort of more comedy based uh yeah. kids tv um and then you know i just always been a huge comedy fan a huge dave fan yeah. um I, uh, you know, 
I watched it. I, when I was 13 for my bar mitzvah, I got a little uh, black and white TV uh in my room um there it is uh and that and i would stay up you know yep. as late as i could sneak it on weeknights when i was supposed to be sleeping and yep. you know I, I watched johnny too but um that was just sort of like okay johnny get on with it let's get to dave because he was my guy you know <laughs> and yeah uh, yeah i i watched as much as i could yeah. um I would sneak anyway, up to watch it yeah, too. Yeah. That's that that that's yeah. that's awesome. And um and Gabe, same thing. Like you guys both, you bonded over over Dave bits and things like that. Remember when? Remember when? And yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I yeah, I would say Gabe hadn't maybe been as familiar or as watched as much. Uh, he wasn't as much of a diehard fan as I was going into yep. it, but definitely a huge fan, a huge comedy fan. We were both huge fans of, uh, I don't know, just thinking about those early days when we were living in LA, uh, yep. we were huge fans of Mr. Show. Oh, and oh yeah. went to, we went to a bunch of those tapings and we're, you can still like see us in the audience in certain shots and we know which sketches were, you know, we were there for and said, we we're Whoa. just yeah, big comedy nerds and uh, into all of that. Um, how happy are you for Bob Odenkirk? Like I'm, oh, I'm, I'm delighted you. for him every yeah. single time I see him uh, do another project or so. I'm so happy for Bob. Yeah. And he's always great. No matter what he's doing. It's, yep. Yeah, he's impressive. Yeah. He's an action star. He's an, he, he, an idol. He, he can do action movies. Like what? Yeah, <laughs> um, it's, I know. Uh, it's uh, crazy. Genius mind, genius performer. Uh, yeah. Oh, that's very cool that you got to see some of those because that's formative years in in so many ways. That experimental, uh, boundary pushing in many ways. Um, the, the 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 creative stuff. I'm Canadian. You know, I, I, yeah, Kids in the Hall were something I loved to to watch, Definitely. and of course yeah. before that, SCTV. But um, I thought that uh, Mr. Show in particular. Uh, took the mantle of of the strange and 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 definitely pushing boundaries and things and 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 went down that path. You're yeah. seeing that as you're in l a in your formative years being influenced by these things. Um, where when did the first professional gig come from? Was that the Nickelodeon stuff? And did that springboard so, you to Letterman? or was there yeah, something the, um, yeah, I'll try not to get it too into there are a bunch of shows along the way, but the the basic show, but um. Gabe was working as a writer's assistant on this show called USA High, which was okay. a Saved by the Bell uh, sister show uh, about a group of kids going to an American school in Paris. And basically the only nod to it being Paris was that you saw an Eiffel Tower backdrop out one of the windows. <laughs> um, <laughs> All transactions were done in in dollars. You know, there was no discussion of uh, euros or you know, blissful uh, ignorance back then. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> it was just like the bare minimum to make it different than any other uh, uh, Saved by the Bell type show. Um, anyway, he was working as a writer's assistant there. I was at the time working as a writer's assistant on the show Home Improvement. I don't know if you oh, remember that one. The Tim of course. Allen. Yeah. Of course. Um, but a couple of writers uh, ended up leaving uh, the show USA High, and they were looking for uh, new writers to replace them. So Gabe was able to, by that point, the two of us had written some samples together. And Gabe was able to show our samples to the showrunner there, and we got hired there as our first job. Um, and it, you know was not at all uh, the type of show we had <laughs> dreamed of working on or anything, but it was a great first job. And we got a ton of experience in the room. It was run like, you know, any other sitcom. Um, you have a psychology degree. You're not in a counseling office. You're doing, you're, you're, you're working on the dream. And where yeah. would you rather be USA high yeah. or, you know, there it is. Right. Like yeah. that's so that a lot was of pinch awesome. moments there too. You're getting paid to write. Exactly. Yeah. So we were there for about a year. Then we ended up, you know, and once we were working there and it sort of gotten in through the back door, we were able to get an agent who helped yep. us get a job on uh, all that at Nickelodeon, yep. um, which was, you know, their version of kids version of Saturday Night Live. Yeah. Uh, it's where Kenan Thompson started and uh, Nick Cannon was uh, wow. there. <laughs> there. And uh, so we worked there. We worked on the show Kenan and Kel, um, another season of all that, then made the leap from that to the speaking of sort of the Bob Odenkirk world um i don't know if you watched the ben stiller show yes uh, um that was another formative uh you know or show that we we loved growing up um but andy dick we heard was going to be doing his show on mtv a sketch yep. show um and we managed to get a meeting with him and that was how we 
somehow made the leap from Nickelodeon to Andy, and, you know, maybe not as big a leap as uh, as you would think, but um, yeah, writing sketches basically. At, for the hold Andy on. At the time in your mind, it certainly is though. At yeah. the time in your mind, because he's coming off news radio at that point in in many ways uh hot polarizing definitely uh right. one of those people that pe a lot uh, that, that the folks are paying attention to uh, at the time that's a big that's a big deal and definitely oh, it was like huge yeah said, and we were huge news radio yeah huge news radio fans me too oh i want paul yeah. sims on here really bad because i want to talk about letterman i want to talk about news radio i want to talk about channeling um oh, so wow. yeah yeah like yes news radio is huge yeah. in my heart too right um, yeah, so we're so excited to get to work for Andy Dick, and he was yeah. at a relatively like uh, together place in his life at, at that point. Um, I don't, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, know where things stand at the moment, but that that was a good like couple of years working for him and writing stuff for him. Were you in LA uh, still, or were you in back LA. to New York? Okay, no, that, that was, was still LA because MTV, yeah. MTV, they had some quarters. stuff in New York. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. so. Um, no, but that was all out in LA. And uh, what happened was in the second season of uh, the Andy Dick show, a new showrunner came in uh, named Jeff Stilson, okay. who yeah. had been, he had been a writer for Letterman. Yeah. yeah. So, and he was still in close touch with Bill Sheft, uh, I think particularly also with the Stangles a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but he basically offered to pass. He said, hey, I think you guys would be great on uh, Late Show. And if you ever if you wanted to get a packet together, I could send it to Bill Sheff to hand off to the Stangles. And so, yeah, we took him up on the offer, obviously. That was an uh, instant like in poker uh, term. That was an insta call, right? Like you were like immediately. Oh, yeah. Yes. OK. Yeah. I mean, the only possible hesitation was that it would mean moving to New York but that was you know we were uh I think I was engaged at the time or had just gotten married maybe um so but that it, that was all like <laughs> we were relatively you know free and clear of uh responsibilities in LA and um so yeah so we ended up you know jumping at the chance to put together the packet it was there were no promises from jeff or anything he just offered basically to send our stuff along an opportunity here's an yeah, opportunity, opportunity. Yeah, yeah and i guess he had seen that our he thought our sensibility would be a good match for the show um in his opinion anyway and uh that a yeah i, I think we had sort of the work ethic that you need at uh late show where you it can be a grind and you're just churning stuff out yep. um so yeah we threw together a packet and i feel like it was maybe six months after we uh submitted the packet that we got a call from the stangle brothers and uh yeah they i think maybe they called us in december and wanted us to start at the end of january so not even a meeting. They, you got the call. Yes, oh, sorry. You're in. Come on over. Uh, no, I guess there was a phone meeting first, but it okay. was the meeting was basically saying like we're interested, and yeah, there was. Uh, I, I think if we had been, you know, maniacs on the phone somehow, then we could have uh, screwed it up for ourselves. But I think yeah, by the time they called, they were sold enough on us. I think they were looking for. They, there was another writing team that started at the same time as us. I think they had. Yep. Uh, some they had a bunch of needs at that point so uh they were yeah uh it wasn't too arduous a uh, hiring process um we've talked about writing teams here uh, at this point here before we kind of get into some of the bits and some of the things that you the experiences once you got there um i think it's probably a good idea to talk about you and gabe for a second and how you worked together like uh, i'm so curious about writing teams i love how uh you know uh, the pants crew embraced uh, writing teams in the sense of no we'll give you both a livable wage we'll you know we're not just going to pay the one position where a lot yeah, of yeah so you've heard do. about that yeah that's oh amazing. yeah yeah um we talked about with carter and a couple other people i think have mentioned it as well like just the culture is different there um yeah and honestly i'm not sure how much it is i mean definitely the worldwide pants crew is great but i'm not sure if that is writers guild mandated in late night i, I think maybe ah. versus um versus sitcoms where they can have you share a salary for whatever reason it's been established that in late night TV, uh, writers get paid individually. Oh, there you go. Okay. So that, that might be it then too. Um, yeah. now you and Gabe, uh, since college, uh, you know, 
things that you wrote together. Then it got to the point where it was professional, where you're actually professionally writing together. You're doing this day in, day out. Um, how do you complement each other? What are the what are the what are the roles? Because clearly, with writers teams that I've talked to, there are definitely defined places that play to each other's strengths, and it seems to be that the one strength complements the weaknesses of the other and vice versa. Is that the case with you and Gabe or was it more like, no, we're just the same note and we're right on pitch together? Yeah. I mean, it's a question we, we get a lot. Um, and I think early on, maybe we thought of it a little more as, uh, I was the story guy and Gabe was the joke guy. If, I mean, that's how people often, you're encouraged to like define yourselves that way, I guess, sure. as a team. Like people expect one person to be story and one person to be jokes. Okay. Uh, but I don't know that that's ever really fit us. I think more it's that we have the same sensibility and we are sort of on the same pitch, like you're saying. Um, and I think that, you know, the main thing, the reason we like, uh, well, there are a couple of reasons that we, we've chosen to work as a team for all these years, but um, one is like, as writers in a writing career, it can be just, you know, a, a battle of self-esteem and like, am I crazy? And, you know, yep. did, like, did you see that? I, like, yeah. And yep. like weird things happen in the room and it's great to have like somebody to bounce it off of like, wait, you saw that too, you know, <laughs> or, or, um, so there's that like career side of things that we're going we're going through it together, which is, has been really nice. It's a less lonely uh, pursuit. Um, but then also the actual writing, obviously, like uh, we feel like by the time we submit anything, it's already been through a little writer's room of the yep. two of us. And uh, it's yeah. not just half baked. It's 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 a little more. It's three quarter baked. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Which can you know have its own frustrations at times when it like you know, people expect it to take half as long because there are two of us working on things, but it actually takes twice as long because where you have to have a whole extra step of showing it to each other and, and dissecting it and punching it and whatever before we, we turn anything in. Um, Is that how it would be? Like like two computers, both set up, doing your own thing, swapping things, or uh, like like what's your process when it comes to that? It depends what the task is or what the okay. which uh, what kind of show. Um Early on, on USA High, when we first started writing together, we tried to have, um, tried to actually write everything together, have one person on the keyboard, but the other one pitching. And it, we realized we were just running out of time. It like, because we would haggle well, over like every little word and like, you know, <laughs> maybe the, the, whatever, the, the funny word should be at the end of the sentence or whatever it is. Um, yep. Just not arguing but just like yeah no you're stuck in the over, weeds you're in the minutia of things yeah. yeah yeah exactly so yeah. we realized and it took us you know a, a couple of scripts there probably to realize that like we just needed to get something down faster and right. then we could rewrite it together so ever since that with narrative stuff when we're actually writing a script that's how we've worked we split up halves each right half of it and then and then we come back together and rewrite it together wow uh, do you uh do you surprise do you ever surprise each other with with directions that things go and that must be that yeah. must be really fun that sounds that sounds a lot of fun yeah it is fun i mean usually we're writing from an outline by the time we're actually scripting um yep. something so and we split up the outline into halves too to work on that okay usually that's based on a an agreed upon uh story and sort of scene breakdown that has happened in a writer's room so there's not a ton of like taking it in a completely different direction but we're definitely surprising each other with jokes and with sometimes we'll add a little runner for a character that yeah. you know, wasn't in the outline or whatever or you know little little things like that so yeah it's, it's always that's a really fun step of the process when we get to see each other's stuff and like oh, wow, yeah, you did this cool thing. Let's try to work that into my half now also or whatever. Um, yeah, so that's, so So we learned that, yeah, we the, it's much easier to rewrite something than to write something from scratch with a blank page. Um, oh, and we had to learn it all over. We had worked for like five years or something before we started working on Letterman, but um, had to learn that lesson sort of all over again. Um, we tried, I remember the, our very first day, one of our first assignments was a top 10 list. 
Yeah, and of course. <laughs> they're like, okay, let's do this. Here we go. You know, first Letterman top 10 list. Lots of, <laughs> like, just the weight of the world on us because, like, yep. this had been the dream. Um, and we just, you know, managed to take probably our 50 or 100 ideas that we had come up with and the only acceptable ones to actually put down and submit by the time we had talked them all through were like, you know, I don't even think we had a full 10 jokes by the time and it was like oh it's time to turn it in already <laughs> and we were like in a panic and uh we you know had maybe eight jokes or something that we <laughs> submitted which is you know from, from, you've probably talked to enough writers by now to know that that's a, a very small number um of you know compared to what yeah. we were expected to produce um yeah. and it was embarrassing and it was like okay but this is what we've gotten it's time to move on to another assignment and so we had to learn again sort of to not be precious with stuff not we weren't going to get a chance to look at each other's submissions we just split up wrote separately and i would say for most of the time we were there on on, on most assignments we worked completely separately as though we weren't even a writing team wow um, oh i find that fascinating yeah uh i mean it was just sort of the way that the the show required it us yeah. to work just because of the constant deadlines breakneck and, just ma break and maybe next. yeah and maybe our slow pace uh of right i think we're <laughs> a little bit slow and methodical in our writing uh maybe more than others i don't know if uh carter and craig you know maybe collaborated more on stuff uh while they were there but i get the sense that they're also faster writers than we are <laughs> Um, I, I, I find this fascinating. You said something that touched on, um, I want to have Tommy Ruprecht back on again um, and, 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 and talk to him more about some of these things because yeah. uh, it's like ping pong, right? Like, like a writer will bring something up and then another writer will bring something else up and, and, and we'll be able to evolve into new areas of discussion. One of the things Tommy said when he was on, I asked him, uh, was there anything, and I'll ask you the same question actually, um, because that fascinates me. Was there ever something that you were in your mind was clear, this should get on, but never did. And he said, the the only ones I could come up with were ones within the first couple months before I learned to not have any attachment to anything yeah. because of how the sheer volume of what was expected and whatnot. Uh, you're smiling. I, I I assume that's a similar sensibility to what where you're at. Yeah, I mean, I just think we had learned that lesson before we came to the show. Uh, we, awesome. we had, had yep. enough other jobs where that was sort of the preciousness was sort of beaten out of us, where you realize like, yeah, you can't hold on to anything or fight for anything. Um, I think maybe on that first job, you know. The truth is probably when we worked on uh, USA High, we thought like, oh, this isn't really what we want to do. This show is a little beneath us, whatever. We might have been like, no, you know, fighting for our idea. No, 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 you don't understand. Yeah. You know, this joke should be this way or whatever. <laughs> had a little bit of that smug attitude that we very soon were, you know. Uh, cleansed of. Realized. Yeah, cleansed <laughs> of, exactly. Yeah, that it's like, no, you're you're writing for the show and you're, you can't be precious about anything. Um, so yeah, I, I don't really have any memories of that at Letterman of having things that like, I'm, I'm sure there were things where I was disappointed they weren't picked, but you have to you very quickly move on and now you're on to the next thing. And, and there was no, um, uh, you know, Dr. Shivago, you know, you know, uh, idea of a, of a, of a, of a tape piece or something that you always wanted to do that you thought would have played and never got done. Was there any itch that didn't get scratched, uh, creatively, um, yeah. you know, wanted to get somebody doing something, Alan or Dave or someone like that doing something, nothing like that. Nothing really coming to mind at the moment. No, no. you were part of the machine. And I, and yeah, I, exactly. I appreciate that. I, I appreciate that very, very much. Um, okay. So you guys get there. You've done a phenomenal job of setting the table here of kind of what it's like. Uh, you get to New York. Um, again, I represent a group of people who look at Miss at New York with a mystique and it is, it just is. And people like me, when we go visit New York, that mystique is nothing but enhanced, uh, you know, because you get to see it, you don't live in it. You get to kind of be in that dream world that is New York and the imagination of working in it, especially in a creative endeavor, beautiful, beautiful ideas and dreams and things. You get there, what part of town do you move into? Um, and 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 what are the first couple of days like? What's the first thing that you remember actually getting on air? How did that feel? So oh, okay. that- I know um, it's a lot of stuff, but yeah, it's good. It's great. Um, yeah, I, 
uh, pretty strong memories of that time. And, and yeah, that, you know, it was all just heightened by this being the dream job too. It wasn't just working in New York. It was like working for my, you know, my work, getting my dream job and, and feeling the weight of that, the excitement, but also the pressure of that responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. And 13 week, and, 13 week deal. Right. That's exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I remember after things like that, I, I remember pretty clearly feeling that after that first day with the debacle of our first top 10 list uh, <laughs> attempt, just feeling like, well, I guess we're just not right for the show and it's not, you know, we tried it. You're breaking my heart. <laughs> we're gonna, yeah, we'll have 13 weeks and, you know, hopefully last all 13 weeks, but I guess some people can do this and some people just can't. And uh, yeah. Is there really... such thing as a three month lease? I don't know if there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. No, I got lucky actually because um, my uh, wife's brother, my wife's uh, parents, had uh, basically been, they had an apartment on the Upper West Side of New York where her Hello. brother had been living and he happened to move out or be moving out right before I got the job. And so they you, like, you didn't oh. kick your brother-in-law out of his place. Yeah, they move swear, over Letterman I, stuff, get out of here. It wasn't that I, he happened I to move I serendipitously. Yeah, exactly. The timing couldn't have been better. So yeah. I was very lucky with my living situation. Yeah, yeah. Live in this beautiful part of town. And uh, yeah, that couldn't have worked out better. Um, and my in-laws were, you know, generous enough to like allow me to stay there for the full two years that we were there. My wife ended up moving. Um, she was in grad school at the time. Yeah. And uh, finishing in L.A. for the first year. So I lived in that apartment alone for the first year. And then she moved there with me. Uh, no kidding. For the second year. Uh, uh, for the context of our of our of our viewers and listeners, uh, we're talking O2, uh, yes. right? Okay, yeah. so so O2, uh, you're in New York, stranger in a strange land, in the dream land, in the dream job. Uh, what what did, what was your wife uh, finishing uh, for grad school? What did she study? Um, so that was she was getting a uh, master's in uh, clinical psychology. Um, <laughs> She is now, she's done a, a few careers along the way, but she's now teaching. Uh, she's a learning specialist uh, at a school. She has a her teaching credential in special ed, and she's also now in grad school again, getting a uh, doctorate in uh, education. So, um, Did she take your last name? Uh, yeah, she, she. Dr. Green, and that's what you have to call her for the rest you, of the life is Dr. Green, I guess. Yeah, now, basically. Okay? I'm gonna, yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Uh, um. So yeah, anyway, the, she moved for that second year that we were there um, and we ended up having our first kid in New York. Um, actually, I think it was about 10 days after um, Harry Letterman was born at the same hospital and our, and the uh, nurse there, the baby nurse told us that she had been uh, the nurse for Harry too. <laughs> Does Dave know that? No. Dave Fun. doesn't know who I am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, Dave has I never get... heard my name. Yeah. Me too, buddy. No, no, me too. Same, same deal. So, um, but yeah, that was pretty cool for me. That's yeah. really sweet. That's yeah. that's and really, actually, yeah. really sweet. And this was, you know, the um, the show put out this script cover when our son was born. I that's one of the souvenirs I dug up. The oh, show, um, which I I thought was great. You know, they um. They didn't, he didn't announce it on the air, which he did with some staffers, uh, babies. <laughs> uh, yeah. but, um, yeah, I was thrilled to have this as a souvenir and my son is thrilled to have it. Um, he's at that time he was talking about Harry nonstop yeah, because exactly. I mean, you know, that's uh, the one thing I loved about Dave, you know, going through my life in the time cycle that I was compared to the time cycle that he was, um, he was always, I always say he was always there for us every night. You know, we take for granted, take for granted the fact that we get to watch this man as the broadcaster himself. And then the company uh, of all of the amazing things that you guys did we take for granted that we got to do that every single, watch it every single day. Um, but when he would go through things um, it was, we went through it with him, we, you know, f seeing fatherhood in him, um, you know, at, at, at the age that he was and discovering the beauty and the joy of it and all that, we got to see it through his eyes and whatnot. Um, did that change the right? So Harry's born, I mean, you become a father at the same time. 
Uh, so clearly there's some blurred lines there of both feeling similar things. Right. Did the sensibility of the material that was written coincide with things that Dave was going through in life? Like clearly it did in 15 with, with the Leno thing, or 2010, I should say, with the Leno thing, because that's what everybody yeah. was talking about, sure. Right. Right. But like moments like that, would the writers ever say, okay, Dave just had a kid, let's write, you know, something different. And I mean, maybe you're not cognizant about it, but do you think that yeah. that that happened? I imagine there's probably some of that. I mean, part of it also is that I ended up leaving the show soon after we had our kids. So oh, I wasn't yeah, because, OK, so, yeah, it would be that was yeah. into that end of 2003. And right. then. Um, yeah, and that was a big part of, uh, you know, we realized we wanted to raise our kid back in L.A. where there's a little yeah. more space and uh, yeah. things would be easier in some ways. Um, Gabe also wanted to move back. His wife had gotten a job. On, uh, his wife was a set decorator and now is again on Jimmy Kimmel, uh, weirdly. Wow. She had gotten that job. He uh, moved he actually left um one cycle 13 weeks before i did i stayed because we had just had the baby and yep. um yeah it, it would have been too quick to try to try to move right then so yeah. i stayed on but basically i wasn't around um much for you know, once dave had the baby as a writer to see if the tone changed in that direction yeah. or whatnot yeah I gotcha. But uh, watching the show, I don't think I noticed much of a, I mean, you know, other than him talking about it a lot, um, I didn't notice much of a tone shift in like the written comedy. Right. Um, right. But yeah, I don't know. I'm sure everything has its effect somehow. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you had a crazy two years there. Like, like that, that, that time of your life must be in a weird, like bubble, almost almost fantasy type type yes. thing. Like, holy cow, this two year period was a bonkers two years for me. Um, yeah. I love yeah, that. Yeah, I, I love seeing the emotion coming out on your face as you're remembering some of these things. Like, no, it's definitely, yeah. It, it feels like, did that actually even happen? Yeah. In some ways it's, it's, yeah, <laughs> it's weird. And, you know, going back through some of my old like memorabilia and stuff that I've kept. Um, yeah. It's, it brings back a lot of memories, but it also does feel like, yeah, totally different uh, life uh yeah my um son, let's let's get the son who was born general. at the end of that is now uh in he's in college in new york in new york now so um he <laughs> funny enough uh a couple of weeks ago told me that he got tickets to see colbert uh so i told him the last time he was in that building he had to have his diaper changed there <laughs> and when i brought him by so everyone could see the baby um but oh. uh, yeah it's it's funny he he has he been there already or is it an upcoming show? He hasn't been to Colbert yet. No. no? Um, no. did you know Rupert very well? Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, ordered lunch from him almost every day and I would go in and he was, yeah, as you as you know, he's so friendly. Like he was one of the people in that world who like knew our names immediately and was uh yeah, uh yeah, one of the most welcoming people there. Um, yeah, and I was trying to tell my son that he, he should go stop by Rupert's because it might be the last chance. <laughs> and identify himself because that's exactly yeah. what I was about to say. Like, uh, if Rupert happens to be open that day, ha to have him pop in and say who he is and whatnot, Rupert will be so happy. Um, uh, Nadine Henley, um, uh, you know, one of the hi-ho babes, she just went in with her son to see and see them oh, again yeah. and all that. He loves seeing the people from the show, but offspring and all that kind of stuff. He He's so... He's still as kind as ever and loves, loves, loves that stuff. He'd get a real kick out of, out of, out of your kid going yeah. there. And, and yeah, I'm going really yeah, to that's, that's, I'll try to oh, get him to do that. Yeah. Super cool. Um, okay. So let's go back to All right. yeah, uh, sorry. the material, the stuff that you got. No, this is great. This is, this is what we do. This is exactly, this is a textbook, perfect show already. <laughs> and we haven't even talked about all the other stuff yet. Um, I'm, I'm just so excited to know the types of stuff that you got on that you were proud of uh the first thing that you got on was the first thing typically it seems that most writers the first thing that we i got on the air was something on the top 10 um right. did something that first day i mean you know skeleton yeah, one, one, of, one of, those, of them get picked uh, of the few jokes yeah one of them did get picked i still yeah remember what the joke was and it was not something that i was particularly proud of but it was more like a move that i had seen them do on the show before the uh the list was top 10 signs you've been watching too much football. And my joke was, uh, 
uh, your hands smell like saddle soap and leather. Oh, wait, that's a sign. I'm sorry. Uh, that's a sign you've been washing too many footballs. One of those. <laughs> and it got a little Textbook bit. Textbook top 10 joke yeah, right there. Right, like you exactly. said. But it was like, it almost felt like cheating a little bit because I knew like that's the kind of thing that sometimes gets on because it's a little off from the know, device. Oh, wait. That's, yeah, all right. But those or were very sorry, funny. That's a, however that was phrased. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, you know, and we watched the show with the writers, you know, every night as it was being taped. And I remember it getting like a little bit of a groan from the other writers. <laughs> which was like, I couldn't disagree, really. I was, yeah. That, mm. Okay, so okay, that moment right there. Yeah. Do they know it's you, or is that just them viscerally reacting to what? <laughs> yeah. Do they know viscerally it's viscerally reacting to that horrible joke? No, no one else knew. Uh, yeah, that was something that surprised me early on. I remember because it was like, yeah, different comedy bits. You know, mostly in top tens, I guess, was where you really weren't aware of who had written what. But when there was a joke that they didn't like, or that they like, oh, all right, you know, that rolling their eyes, like they didn't hold back on, on reacting that way in the room, even though, well, somebody here obviously wrote that, you know, yes. <laughs> it <was> like, <laughs> so it was, uh, yeah, I, you know, they, it was a great, uh, group of writers and, uh, you know, a lot of people I'm still friends with and stuff. And so, yeah, I didn't take it personally or anything. No. It was just like people who were serious about their comedy and, you know, it's like, uh, yeah, they didn't want anything hacky to get on there. And, uh, yeah. Now, uh, is that you and Gabe's joke? Is that your joke? That one was mine. Um, did, did Gabe get one but, on? Uh, I don't remember if he did from that. I think that was the only one from that initial from list. That, actually, okay. He got something on soon after. Yeah. So my was, goal is to get him on here and I want to ask him the same thing. What was your first reaction of what you got on there? I'd love, right. I'd love that. Um, uh, okay. So top 10, yeah, there's that. that was, but the other thing that I, I remember more clearly and that I was more actually proud of was like the first time Dave actually laughed on camera at one of my uh, jokes or bits. Do you remember it? That was a bigger deal. Um, yeah, uh, it nice. was, there were two, there were two things early on. I'm not sure which one was first. The first, but one of them was um, just sort of a found footage thing there. And I, I was sort of constantly trying to stay aware of what was on TV that we could possibly take clips from. Um, it was a weird way to live for those two years. Like anything that happened in the news or anything that was on TV, it was always yeah. like, how can this be material? You know? And that was like my, you know, but there was no YouTube, like, like again, different time period for, for people who are listening or watching this show who have been born and, and bred with YouTube being around you take for granted that, that you, you talk about it being found footage. Like you see something on the, on the, on the CBS news feed or something like that. It's a bit of a journey for you to even get what you just saw. Yeah. You know, like, like that process. Yeah, absolutely. Like it's a different time. Right. But if yeah. you see the exact right thing and you come up with the exact right reaction to it, there's, there's, there's that, that's, that's gold. That's the gold right there. Right. Yeah. So the first one was Ted Danson had been in some TV movie where he played someone who saw ghosts, like saw dead people. And <laughs> yeah. so the bit was Ted Danson reacting to seeing dead people. And it was just like a, you know, mashup or, a, you know, clips of him and his reactions, not ever seeing what he was seeing, but just his you know where <laughs> you imagine that he was you know acting against a green screen or whatever in the actual thing so something ridiculous thing but um i remember that Got dave though dave was tickled laughing dave. yeah and enough to show it again the next night and that was like oh great like that something that actually wasn't just filler you know he he chose to show that the next night take that uh, justin there it is that's another, <laughs> there's another 13 weeks baby right there <laughs> yeah exactly um so yeah and then the other uh the other one that was like that was uh it was off of a news story that was like a, a made-up news story i'm pretty sure about um bruce springsteen someone was trying to get bruce springsteen to run for uh Senate from New Jersey or, or governor or something sure. uh, get into politics. And so it was like an anti, it was like a, an attack ad against Bruce Springsteen <laughs> saying like, you know, uh, Bruce Springsteen once called New Jersey, a death trap, a suicide <laughs> trap. Um, and this is, you know, 
This is a man who, despite having a wife and kids in Baltimore, Jack took a, went out for a ride and he never went back. And it was like, vote no on Springsteen or whatever. That was another <laughs> thing that I remember Dave laughed at and showed again the next night. Um, and showed again the next, oh man. Yeah, that that's... was always a coup when you're like, oh wow, he really liked it. Uh, if he's showing it. So yeah, those were- Attacking was... America's sweetheart uh, like that. Like that's, that's hilarious. <laughs> I could see how he would be- because it's it's yeah. preposterous, right? And it, it just and the silliness of the yep. you know, voiceover guy saying, you know, uh, wife and kids in Baltimore, Jack, you know, throwing the Jack in there, and yeah, it just felt like something David like, and um, I was glad that that, yeah. Uh, so uh, let's take those, that those moments. Yeah, those moments really stood out to me, obviously, because it was like, yeah, it was it yeah, was not just get something on the air, but like something that was pleasing him enough that maybe I'll survive beyond these thirteen weeks. Okay, so the, the the maybe I'll survive beyond the thirteen weeks. That is something that I I think is a is a unique kind of pressure. But the first part that you talked about there, I can't get over how many people, no matter what their role, Jonathan, like like writers, obviously on the firing line of this, I cannot get over how many people that I have talked to, uh, both on camera and off, earnestly. They just wanted to make Dave happy. They just wanted to do a job that just made Dave happy. That's another part of the culture, just like you guys don't take compliments well and all these little things that I'm finding that seem to be linked up with people who worked for pants for an extended period of time. But the other thing is I just wanted to make Dave happy. Clearly, um, you know, it's different, uh, you know, if it's if it's a, a producer getting a good booking, making him smile that way versus making him literally react to something Right, uh, right, you know, be surprised by something. Uh, the satisfaction on that. Uh, my moment with Dave, I made him laugh. Like I, I, I said, I, I talked about my moment that I had with him, where I actually made yeah. him laugh from the audience, and it was a second because in that second he just fired right back and said something even funnier. But I made him laugh just for a second, yeah, and it so was you know one of the. Like. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, when you see the guy who you know has given you so much and who you've just idolized for so long, you know. Uh, laughing at something that you wrote or said like yeah it's just a it's a surreal but amazing experience yeah. it really is uh and I, i'm so grateful that i get to talk to you guys about this and we can and we can you know build community around this let's go back to the springsteen piece for a second here because i'm curious about process you come up with the concept okay springsteen's running for something where there's a fake article about this let's run an attack ad on him okay do you outline that do you immediately start collaborating when do you bring the digital guys in to start doing the video pieces of it how does that go and how many hours from outline to finished concept is it something that's going to appear on tomorrow night show because we don't have time to do it for tonight is it how does that right. how does that go almost all the time it was uh you would pitch it in the morning get it like one of the first things that we were that we would do in a day was pitched extras which were those kind of tape bits that he would do yep. at the desk um and and not necessarily i guess in the at, at that point in the show but usually yeah at the top of the show um and so you would pitch sort of like a paragraph version or a one line version en enough to sell the joke and you would write a list of those that everyone submitted to the Stangles. Gabe and I would write individual lists <laughs> that we would uh, each submit. Um, and then you would get, you know, a half an hour later or something, they would come back to you and, and with, you know, checks on which ones they wanted you to actually write up and produce. And then you were always producing it for that night's show, which was, so then you start sort of the mad rush. You write this, the script and sometimes the script wasn't much more than what that paragraph thing you know these were always short bits so but two to three hours basically this is going on the air yeah yeah maybe a little more point. than that sometimes but yeah something like that um okay. so you would be off to edit it you know the uh Randy Grosak. I don't know if you've talked yeah. to her. Not yet, but we're I'm 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 gonna I've talked to her a lot offhand because we're both yeah. real good friends with Rick, but oh um, right, right. And 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 so yeah, but uh I cannot wait to uh, like even if it's just not record button, I cannot wait to talk to her about some of these things. Um yeah, yeah, yeah. Well the so montage the at the end, I can't wait to talk to her just about the montage. Right. Yeah, Never mind. I, I just watched yes. her um, you know, highlights thing on the letter yep. YouTube channel. Yeah, and uh yeah, it was 
interesting to hear her talk about that montage and uh, putting <sighs> that together with Barbara. Um, so you go talk to Randy or uh, someone yeah, like so that? Yeah, so you go talk to Randy or yeah. um, Jessica Santini, Santini? Uh, yeah. um, who would uh, coordinate like the voiceover actor, come, you know, when they would come in to record it. Usually they would record it. Then you'd be like collecting visuals, trying to uh, you know work with the art department for visual for a piece like that Springsteen thing. It was probably just a few shots of Bruce, you know, yeah. uh, performing, just still photos of him performing and just a voiceover over it or whatever. Um, maybe Chiron's coming up for those lyrics that are highlighted or whatever. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was um, basically you're just down in editing then. And you're missing out on <laughs> the good thing is you didn't have to do every assignment that's coming in because it was like I've if, got an extra I've got to produce I've yeah, got to go get something this, this through yeah exactly so you're then down in editing um, if you didn't get an extra picked on a given day you are basically every thirty or forty minutes uh, getting a new memo slipped under your door with the next assignment <laughs> um, and it was just constant all day and it was like you know often before you had finished the assignment you were working on you get right. what the next assignment is um so it was nice you get a little break from that if you go down to editing but then there's a whole other stress of trying to get the piece ready in time yeah uh, and often we were rushing those pieces to uh dave's in his dressing room we wouldn't we would stand on the stairwell outside his dressing room i never even saw into that room but you hand off the tape <laughs> um and, and you wait to hear you experience. wait for his reaction to come out of the door by yeah that was a whole were, other Just, justin i get would it have been justin or steve that would have uh justin and eric were both yeah. The, yeah in there uh yeah steve was in there i guess working on monologue stuff with him uh too so sometimes he was in there uh yeah. bill chef yeah, uh, of course yeah but yeah, it was Justin and Eric who would be showing it. You'd hand off your tape pieces to them. They would take them into Dave. And you literally and, sit there in the stairwell waiting at this point. Like, yeah. Call and part listening. of your day is right sometimes then. You could, sometimes you could hear. Sometimes you're hoping to hear Dave laugh. Also, I mean, you're always hoping to hear Dave laugh, but sometimes you can hear him actually laughing at the thing. You can't, he's, it's, you can't really hear what his feedback is, but uh, often he would give, he would approve something. Sometimes he would just be like, okay, we're not doing that. Yep. Other times it would be he'd approve something, but have a few little tweaks, like yep. change this, change that. They would come rushing out of the room, hand you back the tape and go, okay, go make this Randy, change. Randy, help, help, Randy. Yeah. <laughs> Basically you're running back to the editor. And there was so many times where you're just watching the clock. The show is about to start. Sometimes the monologue had even started uh, while you're still finishing your piece. Because, yeah, it, you know, there was a little time still to get it ready before he, you know, <laughs> he was going to introduce it at the desk. Um, and then but, sometimes yeah. the, the word comes out of the office, I assume, not strong enough. Yeah. And you definitely would hear that sometimes. Or I guess the way that they would deliver it diplomatically more often was like, uh, yeah, OK, we're good. Yeah. Like, don't need any more work on it, <laughs> which basically let us know, <laughs> OK, it's not going in. Or most of the, yeah, I guess there was a chance that it was uh, good enough that it was going to sail, that it was going to sail through and go on. But there's a uh, bunch of those that are sitting somewhere that yeah. I would uh, like, this is the type of stuff that the roads that weren't taken, um, yeah. there's some, there's, there's gold sitting there uh, right. for sure. Um, and, uh, and, and, and one of my goals is to somehow worm my way like a termite into mm. the pants land and we can start getting some of the stuff out there um yeah. what a what a crazy paced work environment to be in like bonkers what you're talking about right there with these extras did that prepare you uh for for life as a showrunner yeah you know it did i mean just the um sort of the 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 pressure of like uh yeah having to produce something, turn it around quickly. I mean, it's an, um, it's not like being a showrunner for a sitcom because the immediacy is so different, you know, the-, the Yeah, the, the urgency, is a, it's that a night. very the different urgency. pace. Yeah. But the yeah. skill set is kind of the same. Like, okay, in the office, uh, yeah. we're about to watch uh, the, the trailer 
for the documentary and they're going to see it all on the TV together. Okay. So we got to go and do like, it's, it's sort of, yes. you're producing an extra for that, you know, and in my mind anyway, is it, is it similar in that regard other than the pacing? Yeah, totally. There, Yeah. There's, and late show was great training for just like producing your, they let gave writers so much responsibility and trust in like, mm. and I think when we first started, it was like, wait, you, you're not going to have someone else like, shepherd this through you're gonna you know I, i'm just the writer like <laughs> i'm actually now producing this thing like, not anymore kid no nope. yeah. <laughs> yeah and you learn to write things in ways that they were more producible you know from the beginning too because you're gonna have to <laughs> execute this you, you can't just you know i think so often writers are just like yeah someone will figure this out i'll just write you know a version of it that i'd like to see and then it's yeah. somebody else's problem how to actually do it but um yeah, it was great. The The amount of responsibility they gave you at that show was really, yeah, yeah incredible. Um, uh, was there something that you uh, and or Gabe uh, were more consistently, like I talked to Carter and Carter, he had a lot of mailbag stuff. Where yeah, that, just, they, that ended up being just- They were in uh, charge of, they were completely supervising mailbag when, by the time we got there. Yeah. yeah. Is there an example of that where there was something that you gravitated to a little bit more uh, than, than others? Well, the one thing that sort of became our uh, consistent uh, way to, to contribute to the show was, <laughs> um, I don't know if you remember Dr. Phil's words of wisdom that- uh, <laughs> Yeah, uh, went on every night basically for I'd say at least a year. Oh yeah, you guys drove that one well. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and Dave just kept wanting to do them. Um, well, they're great. Yeah, it, and it was so like they were so easy to find, but uh, Gabe and I had to watch every episode of. Doctor what episode has like ten of them? No yeah. problem because you take it the right snippet. It's that almost one. like great. It's almost like Tommy's great moments in presidential speeches yeah, almost was, right like it was that oh. kind of thing it was a little bit yeah before that but it was the same type of thing yeah, yeah. we did yeah, a super right. cut of that i'll talk to i'll talk to don and walter and see if there's a super cut of that because i don't think there's a super cut of uh dr oh, phil's dr. words phil. of wisdom yeah that would i don't be, know i haven't seen one but that um, would be a great one uh and and don yeah. will correct me if he apologize don if, if, if it is uh, he was going to be here today but he couldn't be here today but uh i apologize if you do have that already and i just have forgotten it um on your channel but yeah, that is a that was a fantastic fantastic <laughs> bit that was you guys yeah that was us and we pitched it originally i think as a um as part of like a new for fall thing or things that the show was going to be changing yep. and and it was just supposed to be like a one-off thing that every once in a while we would hear a little bit of dr phil's words of wisdom but I remember distinctly, like, knowing that, you know, Dave had had his whole Oprah yeah. thing, and the Oprah log of, yep. you know, her not calling and all of that, which I think was Carter and Craig's also. Yeah. Um, but uh, knowing that Dr. Phil was coming out of the Oprah world, and I had seen like, oh, this, this guy from the Oprah show is going to have his own show now. That is definitely going to have something that we can use for day, you know, that it it's going to fit into Dave's world somehow. And so then it was just a matter of like, how do we use it? So I, yeah, I remember recording, uh, you know, on, on my TiVo, the first Dr. Phil show and like, okay, let's see what, <laughs> what we can work with here. And, and there's a lot. <laughs> yeah, there is a lot, but um, yeah, just <laughs> narrowing in on that way to, to use his, and he just, you know, set himself up for it time and time again, <laughs> like, Anytime he would sort of, you know, whenever any metaphor about, or simile yeah. that he gave, and he, <laughs> totally, and he, he like takes their, you know, speaks in the persona of the person, like I'm, I'm just a big dumb idiot or whatever. Like <laughs> he was just giving us those, but yeah, it meant that we had to watch every single episode of Doctor Phil, and that became a regular assignment for us, and we would we would switch off who was doing it on a given day, but. um is it in the TV in a corner, like just playing and you're writing other things and stuff. And you're like, Oh, there's one. Like, does it get to that point where it's just automatic where you, you hear it almost instantly. <laughs> it was more like scanning through and fast forwarding anytime anyone else was speaking. And then oh, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. it's like, okay, here we go. <laughs> like he's Dr. Phil's going to talk again. Um, but and here's an example though, right here of, of something that, that enhanced, like, again, greatest bro bo uh, bo broadcaster in history. Okay. Also, you know, smartest comedic mind, you know, in reacting and all of that stuff. You as members of his team, give him this 
And every time, and, and all credit to Dr. Phil, who, as Dave would say, can take a punch better than almost anybody, like no problem making fun of himself. Right. Now you guys are doing this and every single time Dr. Phil is on the show, it's gold because of how you guys are building this to support Dave. This is a phenomenal example of how they feed the, the two feed each other. Yeah, it did start a little bit of a, th yeah, I, I remember it was a big deal when Dr. Phil was going to be coming on the show for the first time after we'd been making fun of him for so long. Yep. And I, and I don't think we knew at that point that he had <laughs> such a great sense of humor about himself. Um, but it was like, this will be interesting to see how it goes. Um, and he quoted some jokes and stuff. Yeah, when he was on the show, you know, um, so it was nice to see that he was playing along. But you're right. Yeah, it was a, uh, it ended up becoming more than just those bits but the great thing for us was that like in 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 one way it was like nice to know that we were going to have something on the show every night just about sometimes there were two of them in a night um the downside <laughs> was like it was very much a formula and like you said he was beating it into the ground and it was like okay sure. maybe it's not always as great uh you know as uh coming up with something new I, 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 okay. And there is that danger, great moments in presidential speeches, same thing, same premise, same everything. But when you find something new that does make you laugh, despite like, it's almost that, that circular thing. It's funny. It's funny. It's funny. Okay, it's less funny, 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 but you keep on it, keep on it. And then it becomes funny again for a different reason. Yeah, right. There's, right. A, there's a little bit of that there because yeah, again, totally. you're working with somebody who is going to say something completely unpredictable. Yeah. You saw this three nights ago, but now tonight's is, you know, it, it catches you. You don't think you're going to laugh, but you do. Right. Right. Uh, which that is a, yeah. I'm, I'm so glad we got to talk about this bit today. That didn't hit my radar at all. And I remember it very, very well. That's uh, what oh, a that's cool, nice. yeah. that's a and very it was cool fun thing. also to see like that the audience after a while started to know it too. And so when yep. the, when he'd introduce it, people would start to, you know, you'd hear. Jonathan, you did a, ref yeah. you made a refillable. Like yeah, exactly. <laughs> one of the hardest things. I mean, I asked so many writers, you know, did you ever try to make a refillable? And, and the first time you did that, I mean, it's probably that probably became a refillable just because it delighted Dave. That's probably why it did. You know, it didn't just go one yeah, time and that was it. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, it was just written as a one off. And yeah, I remember, yeah, the Stengels came to us and said, like, OK, we're going to need more of those. Like, <laughs> get ready to watch more Dr. Phil. So, yeah, they would. Um, yeah, Randy and her her gang would uh, send us the tape every day of the Dr. Phil show. Oh. We'd scan through it. <laughs> yeah. So there's there's the tapestry right there. There's somebody in the control room whose job now it is to make sure you record Dr. Phil off of whatever feed or at home or like how does that happen? Like like these yeah. are all the little chain reaction things that I want to get to with this show. Um, this is fantastic. Uh, okay, so <laughs> um, um, what about um, uh, did you ever do any uh, Alan Coulter stuff? Yeah, we did uh, some mailbag segments with him. Um, yeah. I remember shooting one up in that, uh, you know, up behind the behind the top up on the top area. of the balcony. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where the uh, Oprah and Leno, uh, yeah, thing happened. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, definitely remember that one. It was like a, I don't know, a bit about Alan's first kiss or something. Um, but uh, yeah, we worked with him. I'm trying to remember other bits. Yeah, it was mostly mailbag stuff, I'd say, that we did. Yeah. With Great guy to work with. And uh, so, you know, as you know, up for anything. Yeah. And just sell the hell out of it, too. Just like you could give him anything. And yeah, he didn't just, yeah, knock it out of the park. Uh, like, what about some of the other uh, staffers that we've know, uh, come to know and love yeah. over the years? Pat and Kenny or... We did uh, a bunch of... Um, yeah, we did, uh, some stuff with Pat. Um, yeah, I think Kenny left the show during the time that we were there it was maybe about a year in, um, yep. uh, some stuff with Pat, definitely a bunch of Biff remotes. Awesome. Um, we got sent on. Yeah. I went to the world series with him. Oh, yeah, cool. NBA, NBA finals, uh, one year. And Gabe went to, he, we did a bit where Biff went to a high school prom in New Jersey and Gabe went and uh, <laughs> uh, supervised that. Um, so that was always fun working with Biff. Uh, also just on the streets with uh, fun with the bullhorn. I don't know if you remember him doing yep, that. Absolutely. People, we would ride along and, and do Beat that. Him. 
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, and he was always great to work with. Um, yeah, a lot of fun. And and again, it was a sort of pinch me moment where you know I had been watching Biff for years and was like, oh wait, he's. <laughs> I mean, I knew he was the actual stage manager, but to see him like actually doing stage manager duties on the show and and then also. <laughs> Uh, going to do bits uh, yeah it was just it was great um, um we talked to uh, to jeremy weiner and, and and some other people who have been on the road with uh, 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 a few other people who have been on the yeah, road jeremy with biff. really had some time with biff yeah yeah he <laughs> did in a winnebago or whatever i uh my goal is okay so I'm, I'm gonna throw it out right now let's manifest this right now i'm talking to biff's son and and, and yeah i think dad wants to come on and we'll figure it out okay. how to get it like that's obviously you know talking to him and then to have some of these people who maybe worked with him might you know get questions thrown in there to, to jog memories and things like that because it's again such a breakneck pace but hearing the fondness i would i think that he would love to hear the fondness from some of these people that i've talked to that did go on the road with him and did have these experiences that were just so memorable and fun and they just have such a place in their heart i think he would love to know that um so so yeah. we're hoping to make that happen here uh you know sooner than later yeah and um, i don't know if at a certain point for biff it was like okay who's this newly hired writer now who's telling me what to do <laughs> like i've been <laughs> doing this for so long like <laughs> relax i got this you know but you know, of course we were all you know over eager and and trying to make sure that uh <laughs> we returned with the footage we needed and all of that so um I think yeah. that needed to be the case though. Like you guys were such, you ran at such a high vibration, such a high level. Um, the output was breakneck. Um, you know, a few notables stayed there for, 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 for more than five years or a decade or more longer, but so many times it seemed to be relievers were coming in with a fresh arm who had that energy that you're talking about. And it was just simply necessary because of five shows a week, uh, not nearly as many dark weeks as, as, as Johnny had, you know, things like, right. like, 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 again, this whole show exists because there's gold that you guys found and literally big pieces of gold that got dropped and haven't really been looked at again, you know, other, other than, other than thank God for Giller, uh, and, and, and now Walter and, 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 and pants are actually, you know, getting this stuff out there because there's yeah. so much of it. But I think that energy you're talking about is necessary. And of course, people are going to, you know, burn out over their time. Were you burned out when you were, when it, when it, when it was, when it was done? Um, started to feel a little bit of burnout um, toward the end. Mostly it felt like, I think it was just like we were doing the same kinds of things over and over again and yep. not getting to sort of, there was a, the window seemed to be getting a little bit narrower as far right. as what would get on the air and what Dave was willing to do. All right, like from the beginning of our time there, Dave was no longer doing any pre-tapes or remotes. Yeah. Yep. Um, which, you know. Was he still doing rehearsal? <laughs> no rehearsal. No. He wasn't he, doing, okay. So yeah, this is after 9-11. This is, yeah, yeah. 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 So yeah, he wasn't doing rehearsals. Um, and yeah, so anything we were writing for Mailbag had to be with other people uh other and there was a gr obviously a great cast of characters you could yeah. involve in those things so that was fine um but as far as the actual jokes that would get on to you know it was like started to feel a little bit like we were doing the same thing over and over and yep. um as you know as and you're a writer you're a creative you have other things obviously that are bubbling uh yeah. obviously there's other ideas and things like that shows or 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 um uh, you know, opportunities as well. Uh, I mean, we've talked about this lots. I mean, you, when you can, the moment you can put a uh, writer late night or late show with David Letterman on a resume, opportunities are going to show up. Um, right. That, that's, that surely must've been happening for you. Unless you had the blinders on that surely must've been happening for you at that point already. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't happening so much. I think while we were at the show, maybe we did have the blinders on a little bit, but it was like, yeah. you know, we were focused on, keeping the job and getting renewed for another cycle, you yep. know, another 13 weeks the whole time. Um, but there, it was more like seeing that maybe we could get back out to LA and then work on some more narrative stuff or um, yeah, just other types of shows. Um, 
I think, and and then also personal family stuff like yeah. having had the baby and and Gabe wanting to move back, uh, Gabe and his wife both wanting to move back um, to LA. That's really what sort of pushed us to uh, to leave after a couple of years, more than any burnout or anything. Yeah. Uh, no, that's but, good. It's before the burnout. Like that's that's great. Yeah, that, yeah. That, that's awesome that you got a chance to kind of chart your own course uh, based on life circumstance rather than, uh, you know, uh, I got nothing left in the tank, Captain. Like you know, that's yeah, that's yeah. that's, that's kind of cool that you could do that. Um, I think I know how I'm going to finish this episode because I you know I want to go to I want to go to the office. I want to go to superstore for sure. Uh, yeah. Do we still have some time? Are you still okay? Are we we're okay? Here? I've still got time. Yeah, I'm just in okay. uh, really. I've probably been pretty long winded talking about all this other stuff. So yeah. not to me. Nope. Skip this is great. Love it, to. Jonathan. Like this is all. I I just don't want to inconvenience you in any way. Um, oh, did you go to the um, uh, the 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 final night party? Uh, no, no. You weren't there for that. Okay. What was your last interaction with um the Letterman crew? Uh, Did you go to any reunions of any sort? Did you ever go to any? Uh... There was an art gallery thing out here. I'm trying to remember what it was exactly. It was maybe art from the, uh, like the bumper Mark, cars or something. Mark Carson? Like Mark Carson's bumper? It might have been art. that. Oh, I that's mean, cool. I wanted to go to that. Showing. That's I'm rad. Not sure. not sure if that was what it was, but there were a bunch of the uh, yeah staffers there, and then I uh, just gotten together with people as they've come to you know uh, yeah. Lee Ellenberg and Jeremy were yeah. at, uh, actually on the Universal lot uh, for a meeting one time when we were doing Superstore there, so we got together with them. Um, there was well, we worked with Chris Harris again, yeah. yeah. So, so some small groupings and stuff. Uh, Tom Ruprecht was out here uh, working on, I think he was, it was when he was out here to work on the Goodwin games, which was a Chris Harris uh, yeah. show. Um, so yeah, that was already years ago though now. Uh, you've just named, other than Chris, who I haven't met yet, you've just named a whole bunch of people and the, the, the commonality of them is they're just, again, every single one, nice people. Like I just love the kind, nice people who, who um, it's so, uh, the antithesis of the stereotype of a writer's room, which is Shark Tank and all of that kind of stuff, the exact opposite. The people you're talking about, yeah. exact opposite. Like and 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 more. It's not just them. It's it's other ones too. I love the culture that was there. Oh God, yeah. No, I gotta ask this. Oh. Were you ever? Oh, go ahead. You say go. No, I was remember. just realizing also that uh, just another person who really contributed to that culture and just the nicest guy, as you know, uh, Steve Young. Um, we saw him when his documentary was making the round. He had a, a screening at the Writers Guild out here and uh, Gabe and I went and it was good to catch up with him. And yeah. yeah. How happy are you for that dude for getting that movie made? Like, oh, so happy. That's so amazing. Yeah. Um, oh. And it's just the whole story of it is just perfect. How it started from just doing Dave's record collection and yeah. Yep that whole thing yeah it's great and, yeah and these people like the amount of people that he has gone and shone a spotlight on of joy and love and and for some um even uh a feeling of 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 um vindication almost even like you know you know they were looked down upon but no you were appreciated you were this you know uh mr yeah. bb and who steve just you know tragically lost but 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 knew at the end of his life that it actually came back full circle being able to do that for people um and i mean there's so many stories of that within the pants world i love being able to talk about that uh, cause you guys may not take compliments and like to, you know, uh, but I, I'll do it. I'll, I'll, <laughs> hell, I'll talk about the kindness that exists and how many times people give people hands up and delights and blessings. Um, but here's a question for you, yeah. uh, that goes back to the writer's room. Uh, were you ever in the writer's room watching the show and, uh, you got the call, the phone rings. Oh shit. We don't, uh, time for a new top 10. Were you ever, did you ever known that unique type of pressure? Yeah. yeah there were a couple of times when that happened and yeah. <laughs> that you definitely would feel your stomach drop out a little <laughs> when, the, when that phone rang um yeah uh i don't think it happened very often while I, we were there but um yeah there were definitely some moments where it's like okay rush back to your offices everybody and uh, leave your dinner on the table <laughs> and so uh, you wouldn't do it in the room uh, go back to your offices that's interesting yeah that's how i remember it anyway yeah but it's like take 
10 minutes or whatever, you know, it was not much time to do it um, and just churn out whatever you can. Does the chef show up there and you hand it to him and, and he goes down with it or did like, was there an intern or a runner? Like, like how did yeah, that I feel like it was, um, have you talked to Bob Borden? Not yet. He's on my list. I certainly want to. Oh my goodness. Like he, yeah, he, to Bob. he did all that stuff and would, uh, yeah, he'd be the guy who would have to run okay. our stuff down. Um, Him and McEntee are two guys that I very, very badly want to talk to. Um, both great guys too. Yeah. Absolutely. That's what I've heard from everybody. Um, so, so those who, I can't even fucking believe I get to say this. Hey, those of you who watch the show, who are part of the show and know those guys, nudge them over to this way, please. <laughs> I can't believe how many staffers watch this thing. Uh, that right there is, as far as I'm concerned, I've won. Um, yeah, I just, I, I Oh, I've been loving it. Yeah. I've, I'm oh. so excited to see that it came up. I think I first learned about it because Tom Ruprecht uh, posted that he was on the show and that, yeah. And then I've been listening to them all. I want everybody. Uh, so, so if I haven't gotten to you personally, or if I haven't, you know, sent feelers out or whatever, don't be left out. It's just because I don't have it in front of me. So everybody who listens or watches, <laughs> there are a lot of people, out. a lot of reach people out. come through that place. Um, well, that's just it. Somebody, somebody said to me the other day, you're going to run out of people. And I looked at them like, you're joking. There's no right. way I'm going to run out of people ever. Cause we haven't even gotten to, you know, some of the, the, the guests who worship Dave, uh, that, that weren't allowed to talk about how they worship Dave. Cause the producer said to them now, don't talk about how much you love him, but there's <laughs> like, like this thing has, there's so much meat on this bone. And, and, uh, yeah, uh, sure. I'm, I'm really grateful that, that, that you've taken time to do this. You transitioned over to, one of the greatest and you talk about how superstore maybe has doesn't have it yeah uh, the thing about the office was it had time to percolate it had time to kind of find its audience and then turn into the growing juggernaut sensation that it became you got to go and finish out the office uh yeah. i'm one of those guys that loved like to me robert california sounded like something that would have been a name of a character on letterman like 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 there were things in the last okay. two seasons that i loved you were there for the last two seasons of the office right actually just the last season i the wasn't even there for okay. the robert california year yeah <laughs> okay. yeah came in after that um yeah how and crazy it, it, was that that you got to work on the office insane yeah and gabe and i it was our third time meeting on that show when we finally got the job um we wow. had been in consideration twice before had come in met with greg daniels met with a bunch of the writers because he likes to have these meetings where he cycles writers through to like get a feel for the people and uh alchemy yeah. checking out the alchemy of, yeah. of, of things and okay yeah exactly so we came close two other times and then finally on our third time, we actually didn't, it, it was um, not even a foregone conclusion that we were going to get to continue to write for The Office because Greg Daniels also had uh, at that time um, a pilot for an adaptation of the show Friday Night Dinner that was a, a British show that I think, actually, I think John Beckerman is doing a adaptation of now uh, right now um yeah. but um yeah uh so he greg daniels had that show he was it was looking like that show was going to get picked up but it hadn't yet gotten picked up yeah. and he wanted to hire writers for the office but they were making him split his staff between the two shows oh, so wow. our deal when he hired us was that we would start working on the office. And yeah. if in the first month or so, or a couple months, um, Friday night dinner got picked up, we would be moved over there. What a uh, big shot. What yeah. a big shot Greg Daniels is. Like, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah. so, that's like some Aaron Sorkin stuff out there. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's that's bonkers that you got, you know, but the I've idea never, that- I've never switched years. I've never rooted against someone's show as hard as I did against Friday night dinner because all we wanted was to stay in the office. It was the, you know, another dream job. It was, you know, one of our favorite shows. Um, and I had definitely very much that same feeling starting there of like, Oh my God, I hope I don't mess this up because this is the, the what I've always wanted to, you know, a show I've wanted to work on for so long. So um, I, I like, Okay, so I don't care if we segregate the audience at this point here. Like, I just don't care. I'm, I'm sorry. It just, it's. I don't know the next time I'm going to have the opportunity to talk to you about this stuff. Um, and 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 I hope there is another one. But, uh, okay. So at this point in the series of The Office, 
okay, we've gone through the, the the transition of Steve being gone and all that stuff and 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 these things. We know that we're wrapping things up. We know the tension with Jim and Pam, but like that, which is in my God, in my lifetime, I they're the Sam and Diane, or I don't know who else you want to compare them to, but right. but Jim and Pam are special to the world. Um, the tension, the wrapping up, the idea that that, that we're now breaking the fourth wall. Uh, you know, again, very Letterman esque. We're getting this chance to see the crew and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. You guys got to be there for that part of the office, and again, as far as finales go, grand slam home run. Uh, of a finale of a series finale um, and, and the lead up to it as well. You got, you got people to care about uh, Dwight and Angela, almost the same way they cared about <laughs> Jim and Pam at the beginning. Like what a season to be on. Again, I've thrown out a whole bunch of shit. There. Yeah, no. um, but yeah, what- it's all exactly spot on, you know? Yeah. It was so exciting to, to be part of it, but to take all these characters at, you know, who we'd been following the whole time, but to get to wrap up their stories and yeah. figure out what was, all, you know, although I will say like the big um, exciting thing, I think for everyone who was working on the show for season nine was that Greg was coming back and running the show. Yes. He hadn't been running it for a couple of years. Or, yeah. Uh, I forget how many, but um, he came back at the top uh, beginning of season nine and he had a pretty clear idea of what he wanted to happen in that, season yep. um for most of the characters i would yep. say like at least you know the big tent poles of the season and and definitely where they were going to end up at the end of the of the series um so a lot of it was just coming in and like trying to you know serve that vision and uh we weren't you know i won't say that gabe and i you know had any say in what or or the know, arcs necessarily yeah and and, and where characters ended up or, or how things were wrapped up it was like we were excited to be there trying to give him what he wanted and uh you know pitch things that could uh map on to his vision for the season basically um i gotta ask okay because like i mean i've got so many lines and and moments from that last season uh, you know, Dwight getting his black belt and, the, uh, you know, Dave, little David Wallace lines along the way. Um, were there any moments in that season that come to mind right away that you and or Gabe uh, put into any of these char- iconic characters mouths or, or or moments that was like, nah, that was I, I, I was me and I love that one. Is there anything like <laughs> that that you can kind of throw out there that? Yeah, OK. You did that. I'll mention one of uh, one of Gabe's uh, jokes was a big one that gets quoted. Of course, you're going to mention one of Gabe's. You yeah, can't. Yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was in the finale, uh, the Michael Scott line. No, sort of my kids get like that's my favorite line, and that's <laughs> his line. That's Gabe's line. Every parent's dream. Yeah, the my kids all grew up and got married to each other. It's every yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. So that was like the big one. I think that is. Oh God. <laughs> There you go. Yeah. Wow. And then the other the other thing that's just sort of an interesting, like we wrote an episode where um, Dwight was teaching Aaron Dothraki, the language from Game of Thrones. Um, and the interesting thing that came of that, neither Gabe nor I watched Game of Thrones at all, but we were sort of assigned that story and then had to figure out how to write that. But we, <laughs> there's a scene where he has phrases up on the whiteboard and he's teaching her uh how to say like i throat rip you throat rip he she throat rips <laughs> um conjugate the verb throat rip i love yeah, it exactly and the, the <laughs> um the guy who actually came up with dothraki the the language on game of thrones saw that episode and said that we had <laughs> credited us with um coming up with a new uh I guess syntax rule for Dothraki. Um, we had sort of just based it on, you know, I speak a little Spanish and I had sort of like based it on what I thought, you know, if, if we looked at like he had come up with this whole glossary of, of actual Dothraki words and uh, but automatically it those, made sense and it, yeah, it, it, it's it, like that's how it would work, you know, syntactically or whatever. And that is now he adopted that as part of Dothraki and calls it the Shrudian compound uh, after Dwight Schrute. <laughs> that was our other, not really that office related, but other. Uh, uh, oh, that is contribution there. Damn, and Jonathan, uh, that's amazing. 
and Asian Jim was the other one that that. Gets oh, that was such a good one. The cold open. <laughs> yeah, the cold open with, with the pictures Paul. changed. Uh, oh, that was that, that that you know what I loved about that one? That felt like it would have fit right into uh, uh, season two or three, because I think the hottest ones like the vending machine um, and and it, uh, there's a few other ones that I could think of. Uh, him coming dressed it dressed as Dwight uh, right. early on. You know, um, that one there, Asian. Uh, Jim, I think, was um, in my mind a really good throwback that could have fit very, very easily in season two or three. Uh, oh, that right. was such a good cold open. Oh, that's yeah, that was a fun. That was one of those moments, like I had said, with you know the Dave moments, where it was like, okay, we, we're safe here. We've pitched something that has gone well, and it yeah. got it's going on the air, and like we're gonna be okay here for a little bit so we got the yeah the rest of the season will be fine we'll we'll, yeah. we'll finish and the show out yeah that's how i tend to operate it's like just <laughs> so much stress and and, and oh. nerves until you get a little bit of relief from something like that so you can barely even enjoy it you're just you're just thrilled to be hanging on um so. oh god that's that's fantastic um i think about the I obviously the rap party for the office you were there for that kind of stuff right at yeah. the end of the I, I think of Paul Rudd uh at the end of friends and uh you know uh, there, there there's this legendary story about how the friends it's the last episode of friends and, and they're all hugging and all these kinds of things and Paul Rudd is going on because he just showed up at the end yeah, he's exactly. going, I love us yeah <laughs> well I was gonna ask was that yeah. you guys a little bit like like feeling this is a weird place to be because it's such a big moment it means a lot to your heart obviously as fans and things but then you're seeing these some of these people who have been there in the trenches yeah. for the whole time uh, that must have been a really surreal experience of finishing the office yeah it was definitely like that yeah and i, I still feel a little like that when people mention well you wrote uh, you know people know that i wrote for the office or whatever and i always feel like i have to say well just the final season like <laughs> didn't really contribute to the part you liked the most about the office yeah, except for gabe writing one of michael scott's most iconic lines ever like that was oh that that is crazy that he wrote that uh but not crazy because i mean you know you think about where you guys came from um and and, and i mean okay you got a few minutes for me to talk about superstore sure sure yeah because and i think that that I'm is sure going to be a show. Be holding on until now but we'll see <laughs> I get, I, I don't, I don't care. Like, this is the show that we do. This is the, it's long form. We go deep. Uh, yeah, no, I'm happy to talk about it. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you, brother. <laughs> um, I, uh, so, so some of the audience knows, not very many of the audience knows this, I guess, about me. Uh, um, so I had a career at Costco Wholesale, like a full-on career. I was in the marketing department, uh, 23 years I worked for Costco. Uh, uh -huh. they, I built my financial business on the side and built it and built it and built it and got to the point where I was making a kind of a full wage. And I would diminish my role at Costco until I finally decided to just leave it. I stayed there longer than I needed to because I actually loved it. Um, met my wife at Costco. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and so both of us, you know, worked there for a long time. And I'll tell you this, we watched the first couple episodes of Superstore uh, as they aired. And I'll, tell you this straight up um and this is going to be a massive compliment to you because i know that this is not the case now which flabbergasted by right. candy and i looked at each other and we're like too soon we could not watch it um because it was just it's like that shawshank redemption thing where red is talking about being institutionalized you've been there for too long and all this kind of stuff working right. for that environment um does that um, it, it certainly does that. And, I, and I'm not, I'm not being disparaging. I'm not being anything about it because the people in those boxes become family and friends and the drama of everything that you can imagine happens. Uh, your show was in many ways where it would seem far-fetched to the civilian, not at all far-fetched for people who work for the box store. We would see your guys' names in the credit too, but, but this Justin Spitzer guy, we looked at the first couple episodes and we're like, clearly there is a guy who worked for a big box store that is going through therapy right now. And this show right. is his therapy right. only to find out that none of you have ever worked for a big box store. Not really. And, no. and, and, and it just happened to be, uh, you had some consultants and stuff that were on the nose. I got, I I've set the table for this. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we did uh, a ton of research. Um, 
and yeah, all credit goes to Justin. He created the show and just, we had worked with him on the office in that yeah. one season we were there. And so he brought us along to help him with the show when it was getting started, but he did, we weren't involved in the pilot or any, or, you know, coming up with the characters or any of that. That was all yeah. him. Um, but yeah, once the staff was hired, we just did a ton of research. We would go and tour uh, targets mostly. Yep. I think every every season at the beginning of the season, we would take a tour yep. um, where a manager would lead us around and uh, we'd get to ask questions and stuff. Um, and we, yeah, we were on their uh, employee websites and stuff where there's yep. something called the break room for Target where employees can... Uh, talk about different issues and commiserate and what <laughs> talk about crazy customers and all of that stuff. Um, so we just did a lot of research. Um, we had people come and talk to us about uh, from Walmart about um, yeah. attempts to unionize. And yeah, well, I saw those at Costco. I saw a couple warehouses, one that actually did it and then came back a few years later. Uh, oh, yeah. That was, oh yeah. Uh, terminology was like, like uh, what, the first time you guys use the word go back, what are you doing? Oh, I'm on go backs. Candy and I looked at each other. That was actually when they said go backs, that might be when we stopped. But we came back to it and we absolutely loved the whole thing. We ended up binging it. Uh, okay. you know, we 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 ended up seeing it when the, the final season aired. We ended up watching those week to week. So we had caught yeah. up with it at that point. Yeah, great. But but yeah, like your terminologies were bang on. Uh yeah. the storylines I mean, sort of were like, bang on. Yeah. I mean, go backs and it sort of became a running joke in the writer's room that like everything was about go backs, soft lines, uh, <laughs> always mentioning those things. Yeah. Whenever we needed someone to exit to go do store stuff, they were going to zone soft lines. Yeah. <laughs> soft lines, hard lines, haba, uh, yeah. all of these departments. Like, yeah. But it, it became a little bit of our, yeah, sort of go-to. Like We only knew a few little terms that we'd use over and over again and hope nobody noticed. And I think we then did have some jokes where new employees would be like told to go zone soft lines and they'd be like, I don't know what that means. <laughs> like, I don't speak your language. Um, but yeah. Uh, oh, that's, that's awesome. Uh, gratifying. Like, yeah, I mean, to, it was like, I, I think it was the Greg Daniels example on the office of trying to make things yeah, as real and grounded as possible to allow for, I mean, obviously there was big, huge comedy on that show and, and ridiculous things would happen on both shows. Um, but if you base it in a grounded, real feeling world, it sort of gives you license to go and do some crazier things. Yeah. You turn it up to 10, the idea of the copier being the bane of somebody's existence or having to send a fax three times because right. the machine is faulty. Okay, that is a relatable to the point, and then then you bring Dwight dressed as a as, as a whatever and, and, exactly. and go from there. But but yeah, like like and and Superstore was a fantastic example of it. I can certainly see why. Just again, I have talked to members uh, of the Costco staff that are still friends of mine, and we've talked about Superstore sometimes for like twenty minutes or a half hour talking about your show and relating it back to our experiences working for that place. Oh, uh, like, uh, well, yeah, like you need to hear that. And I'm, I'm certain I'm not the first to tell you this. Like you, you must have heard this many, many, many times over. Like it's such a beautiful show. No, that's nice to hear. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. We were trying to, to capture a real experience as much as possible. And yeah, it's not always, you know, in, in a uh, big colorful network sitcom you know you don't always get to to actually deal with real stuff as much yeah. or, or you know have that it's just such a plus when you you can ground it in reality i think and and hit a nerve because you did hit you nerve. hit a nerve yeah. In, yeah. in a good way yeah and we tried to you know bring up some or deal with some social issues and stuff like that um that you know we always tried to just uh use for comedy but it because they were again based in things real people were dealing with like uh it, it made the comedy all the better so it's it certainly Thanks. did yeah, that's really nice of you to say oh god well it's right from the heart it's it's just uh and i and i know i'm representing um a large number of people who would say the exact same thing had the, op the opportunity uh, uh was there a favorite character that you had to write uh, uh that you wanted to write for on on that show um and there were a lot of Justin created a lot of really fun characters. Um, yeah, 
I mean, I will say it was a thrill, you know, going back to my comedy roots and education and stuff. It was a thrill to write for Mark McKinney from Kids in the Hall. Uh, so, you know, Glenn was always really fun to write for. Yeah, there's a character. Like, I mean, you want to talk about a modern character in a in a in a in a in a sitcom or whatever you want to call, you know, the the the, the documentary style. Uh, what we have now is our version of a sitcom. I mean, yeah. Glenn has got to be up there as one of the most original characters in the modern age. That guy was multi-layered in all the right ways. And there you go, Mark McKinney. That's that's uh, yeah. And I remember going to um, the first uh, table read for the pilot, actually, because we were helping Justin a little with that. Um, but and and hearing the voice that Mark was going to be doing for Glenn. <laughs> was it that high squeaky voice right from the start? Like he oh. <laughs> It was, and I almost <laughs> felt like, did he run this by anybody? Like, <laughs> are we sure we're all okay with this? And I was skeptical at first, and then it just grew on me so much, you know, it's, because that was, you know, one of the obviously bigger, cartoonier uh, uh, aspects of the show. But there are people who have those voices, and hundred uh, percent, yeah, and he, yeah, that he became definitely one of my favorites to write for, and and yeah, just I can imagine Mark, Putting... who's the greatest guy, just the nicest most down-to-earth guy too oh really... isn't that lovely is our that whole nice cast to our, yeah our whole cast was incredible and and loved working together and like they would hang out even when they weren't working on the show <laughs> and it's like yeah it was like we really lucked into something there with you know and, just uh, like costco employees just so you're aware uh like <laughs> like seriously a lot yeah. of them the, and they hang out in pods and and you know because you got 400 people that work there uh, in, 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 a, in a costco example and there are cliques within and and divisions within and this is where right. the debates start and the gossip goes around like it was you guys nailed it uh That's from my perspective anyway um to finish off on on, on some letters uh, is okay first off is there anything that i miss anything you, you kind of thought about any debris that uh, oh, I'd like to talk about this today. Uh, other stuff that you saved from the show. Um, anything else that uh, you wanted to kind of talk about today in this installment? Um, yeah, I don't know. I feel like I've sort of droned Good. on long enough. But uh, yeah, I think there have some. Uh, uh, yeah, I collected some some souvenirs, but it's nothing. Yeah, that we can't show next time. <laughs> okay, well that sounds that sounds great. Um, I do want to get Gabe on here, and then maybe one day I, I haven't had a team. Uh, you know, I had Jerry Mulligan and, and Jeff on together. That was a lot of fun. Uh, yeah, I would love great. to have a team together here at some point and, and maybe, you know, multiple times. So, uh, you know, please, please, please don't be a stranger. If there's anybody, you know, that I haven't reached out to or would like to come on, please get that in my, um, in, in my viewpoint here. Uh, can I do a quick, uh, let's do a shout out to our one and only sponsor. We got one sponsor on the Letterman podcast, one sponsor only. Don't know how much longer I'm going to be able to say this because Rupert G is selling the hello deli. Rupert and May are selling. The, the the joint uh paul was on uh last week he suggested that he and i buy it i like that idea yeah, I like that um, uh, rupert amazing guy amazing sandwiches go see him right like and yeah. you're upset on that uh, he's just the best yeah and that was yeah he was <laughs> it's just one of those things about dave's world where it's like no that's the actual that's not an actor that's the guy who is selling sandwiches <laughs> who happens to have the place by the Ed Sullivan theater. So yeah, we would order our lunches from Rupert every day. You know, did you ever write anything for him? Yeah. I mean, uh, all the time, but uh, mostly those sort of what were called actives where it would be like something happening in the deli where, you know, yep. a game, a, a, someone brought in from the street to play a game with Rupert or whatever, those kind of things. I'm not, yeah extras you know, and actives um yeah well, right all the weird names for things only uh, once, used on that show fantastic <laughs> and we want to know them all um go to hello-deli.com if you want to get uh i mean dave gave the license of the late show with david letterman to rupert uh, again um uh, we don't talk about that too much on the show because we don't embarrass anybody not that he'll ever hear it anyway but um <laughs> i i you know really really rupert is so grateful uh and 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 you know we don't know what's going to happen when he closes the shop so if you want a letter a uh, late in the show with david letterman shirt mug hat uh, some of the other stuff, go to hello-deli.com. Um, you know, and if again, once again, if you ask really nicely, Rupert, who packs these orders himself, if you ask him to add onions to your order, he'll probably do it. Um, Jonathan, I just can't thank you enough for freeing up time for me today uh, and, and to go down this trip down memory lane. I, I, I am so grateful for you. I'm so grateful for the things that you have done, knowing 
the Dr. Phil thing right there. Again, I say this compliment all the time. You are responsible for putting gray matter pathways in my brain. Uh, <laughs> you, we've talked about just some of them today. I thank you very much for well, you. your contribution to entertainment, your contribution to, to me, your contribution to the body of work that is David Letterman Company. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Well, thank you, yeah, for including me in this. Um, you know, I feel like I made a tiny dent compared to some of these other people that you've interviewed. Uh, so, yeah, I was really excited that you reached out to me. Glad to be a oh. part of it. And it ain't going to be the first time, so uh, get used to it there, buddy. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much. I'll, I'll close it up right here and we can say our, uh, our goodbye privately. Um, that's another episode of uh, the Letterman Podcast with Mike Chisholm. Coincidentally, I am Mike Chisholm. Thank you and good night. Overcoat and underpants.